Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to these sessions, afternoon sessions. We have a lot of good afternoon sessions, a <laughs> lot of tracks in parallel. So we see today, now I think it's already here with me, right? We have uh, Professor João Alexandre Pasqualin and Professor yeah. Mashu Hosh, don't know if it's the right mm -hmm. way to pronounce, <laughs> from University yeah. of Haifa. On the sequence of these panels, these panels there will be three panels in, in sequence. The second one will be um, with uh, Professor José Eduardo Storopoli. We will also moderate a, a conversation with Gustavo Meschi also from the University of Haifa. And the third one is again Professor João Alexandre Pasqualin with Professor Olivio Guedes. Very interesting presentation. So enjoy the day, enjoy the presentation. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think, uh, can we start the, 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 the section? Yeah, I will share my uh, slides. Uh, let's see. Uh, do. Now, do you see my slides? Okay. So, yeah. uh, for, first of all, uh, I want to, to thank Professor Mashur for his uh, present here, presence here in this in this section. So, uh, I want to thank him, uh, and uh, I want to also thank the audience of the section. It's a pleasure to have all you hear in the session. And uh, please, Professor Mashur, if you allow me, uh, I would like to, to read the CV that you, you have sent to, to me. Please, may I? Good. Okay, okay. So let's introduce mm -hmm. Professor Mashur for our audience. So Professor Mashur is a faculty member at the University of Haifa in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Management. Since 2017, he is the head of the Global Green MBA program. Dr. Mashu received his Bachelor of Science degree in civil and in the environmental engineering from the Technion in 2007. He earned his PhD in hydrodynamics and water resources engineering from the Technion in 2011. His research interest covers optimization under uncertainty, design, operation, and monitoring of smart water systems. Dr. Mashur is attentive to the decision-making, policy and model development and the application in the Israeli water section, sector. He develops models for the Israeli Water Authority to enhance the operation decisions of the national water supply system under future water resources and demands uncertainty. Dr. Mashur models are cu currently in use to support decisions of the Israeli Water Authority. Dr. Mashur is also very active in research. His publications are published in top tier journals in the field of water resources management. His research group is pioneer in water security systems, and these innovations were recently manifested in winning the first place award in the battle of cyber tax detection algorithms organized by the uh, EWRE of the ASCE. So professor, thank you again, and please make yourself comfortable to, to begin your lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the invitation. So um, as you uh, heard, my research is on water resources systems. Uh, I do uh, a, a focus on system analysis of water resources, uh, considering operational uh, and uh, uh, design uh, of these uh, systems. Um, so I focus on regional water systems uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in Israel and around the world. I more focus also, I have also focus on uh, water distribution systems in urban uh, areas. Uh, and uh, recently I become more, more involved in smart water systems, uh, considering the security aspects of these uh, systems. Um, uh, my uh, previous research 
uh, included uh, um, uh, um, uh, research on uh, physical attacks of such systems like uh, contamination attacks on water uh, infrastructure and cyber attacks on water infrastructures. Uh, today, I will divide my talk into three uh, themes. The first theme is about uh, urban water systems and how we manage uh, such uh, delivery systems in a, an efficient and an optimal way and how we can suggest a spectrum of solutions ranging from low cost solution to a more sophisticated uh, and more advanced uh, a solution in which we can make our water infrastructure smarter with a little bit of investment. We don't need to really to uh, have an ex expensive a expensive infrastructure in order to make our water infrastructure uh, more smarter. Uh, we show in our uh, recent papers that we can actually uh, make the water system smarter with small changes and with small adaptations, uh, as we will see uh, in the next uh, section of the presentation. The second section will be on regional water sectors. So in regional water sectors, I will show you uh, a, a, a models that we are currently developing for the water authority in Israel. And the water authority in Israel is, is, is actually um, responsible for um, allocating the water from the different sources that we have in Israel uh, into uh, the consumers. And I will show you how we deal with that and how we can uh, make better decisions using uh, computerized decision support systems. And in the last section, I hope you will reach there, it is the uh, security aspects of the water distribution systems, and they will start with uh, contamination attacks and how why contamination attacks is an issue, how we can address them, and what, what is the current status of, the, of this topic in the literature, and then move to a more recent uh, discussed topic, which is the cyber attacks on water distribution systems. So let's start from the, I will see that we will move really fast between things because the details are not really uh, how the method work and the, the specific result is not what, what is the message that I want to convey to you. It's all about what, what are the options and how we can uh, a, a manage our water infrastructure in a smarter way using modeling and using uh, advanced methodologies, uh, uh, as we will see uh, next. So the first section is about decision support systems. DSS stands for decision support system for cost saving and robust operation of urban water system. So water networks are comprised of a, a system which have sources. A source could be a lake, a source could be a desalination factory, a desalination plant where we desalinate, uh, desalinate um, seawater uh, into uh, fresh water. It could be uh, water from wells, from aquifers, from underground water. And we use pumps. We use a, a pump to, to uh, push this water, to deliver this water from source to the consumer through pipes. So we have pumps of different kinds and different shapes and different uh, uh, power. And we use these pumps to deliver this uh, water, to push this water from source into the conveyance system that will take this water to consumers. We also have uh, different hydraulics uh, elements like valves and of course the pipes uh, and reservoirs to store the water uh, when needed. And of course, the small tanks uh, uh, that we have uh, inside the, the city or uh, surrounding the city in order to make the system operation more flexible. Okay, so, uh, and we, 
after all, the purpose is to take water from source to uh, consumer. This is the, the purpose. In this area of water distribution systems, the literature is really very rich. You will have different methodology and different focuses on what we can do and how we can do better in managing our, our water distribution system. And this is basically because water distribution systems is one of the most critical infrastructure in every nation. So there is a lot of focus and a lot of research and practical work on these systems. Here in this chart, I will show you all the uh, currently active research areas on the topic. Now, what I'm going to talk about in this uh, section of the presentation is the operation aspect of water distribution system. So we are focusing on operation, and when we talk about operation, I want my system to operate in an optimal way, in the best way uh, that I can achieve. So water distribution systems is a really a classical example of cost versus reliability trade-off. I want to minimize the cost of the operation, but I also want my system to be reliable. I want to deliver water in a specific quantity and specific quality to my consumers and answer and meet their demand in, a, in terms of quality and quantity. So in order to do that, we tend, or water operators, tend to keep the water uh, level high in the tanks because they want to be able to adapt to emergency situations. If you have fire in the system, you want to have enough water to use. Uh, you need also to uh, cope with situation of failures, like uh, if you have a burst in the system. And in case you have a shortage in energy, if you have a power a shut off, you want the ability to uh, supply water. So in order to do that, uh, uh, the system operators tend to keep the, uh, the, um, the uh, water tanks uh, full. Okay, but keeping these water tanks in, a, in, a, in a high levels is actually not good in terms of cost. We can do better in managing our system in, a, in a, a minimal cost if we manage or operate the water tank level in a, a better way, in a, a wise way, in a smart way. This smart way should take into account the energy price during the day. In most countries, I also think it's relevant to Brazil and many other countries in the world, the energy tariff, the energy tariff, the electricity tariff is not fixed during the day, especially for large energy consumers. The energy tariff is not a constant. It's changing depending on the demand of energy. So how we can operate our system in order to take advantage of this energy tariff structure and to, uh, uh, so to minimize the cost of a, the operation. This is one of the most uh, asked questions in the literature to develop methods that can actually uh, 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 take advantage of this electricity tariff and make the system operation uh, better. So we need to balance these two objectives of reliability versus cost, and these are conflicting objectives. Okay, so we we want to guarantee the reliability and to minimize the cost in the same time. What we can do to do that? So we have different control schemes that could be used in order to, uh, uh, to achieve a certain objective. Think about it like a GPS. In the old times, we used to use a GPS, which is not connected to the internet. And it's actually, it sees only the map which is embedded inside the GPS, okay? So I call, it, I call this a local control scheme because you, are, you just know what you have embedded in the device. But nowadays we have uh, Google Maps and we have Waze and 
other navigation systems which use online data and it's always uh, updating its database and uh, taking feedback from the real world in order to adapt and give you the best thing to do, okay? So it's the same way in what? You can have local controllers and you can have a central control. A central control is basically uh, a control room which sees everything. So we have sensors divide, a, a scattered in the network and we see all these sensors and we can control pumps and valves and we can control every hydraulic or most of hydraulic elements in the system. And we do that, we take all this information and we uh, process them in order to do the best thing which uh, can minimize the cost of the system operation. But, so these systems are really expensive. You need to have a control room and you need to have a lot of sensors scattered in the system. And mostly you, are, you need also a very powerful computing uh, capabilities because you need to process a lot of computations uh, in order to make the best decisions to do. Usually we call this a uh, model predictive control, which sees everything uh, and uh, react to it. Actually, we also need a demand forecasting model. We need to, to see, okay, what's, what will happen? What we will assume what will happen or predict what will happen in terms of demand and then plan uh, our uh, pump operation. And from this, uh, we, um, uh, we take the best decision possible. The other way, the cheaper way, which is mostly very popular in the, in the real market, in the real world, is to use a local controller. It's just a small device like you see in the picture, and this device is programmed in advance. It's not connected to the internet, it's, it's really something very simple, and the program is embedded inside this local controller. And uh, the program control control the pumps, when to turn off the pump and when to switch the pump. Uh, so as I said, it's an offline system. It's not connected. It does not see everything like the central control scheme. It's only very limited boundaries. It's, or maybe it can see one sensor or two sensors. That's it. But so as you see, there is a, a huge advantage to use a uh, centralized scheme because it sees everything and it's a very uh, uh, sophisticated way to manage the system. However, it's a very complex way to uh, manage the system as well. It's also expensive way to do that. So most, despite that we have a lot of literature and a lot of progress in this field of centralized schemes, you can see very little adaptation in the real world for such sophisticated systems. Most water utilities, they still use a local control scheme, okay? It's very popular in, in practice and you will see it in every water system. So we thought how we can make this local control scheme a wiser, a little bit wiser than what it is currently uh, in the real world, okay? So you will see, this is a typical example you can see here a typical example of a pump uh, which take water from a source to a tank and this tank will distribute the water to the houses. Okay, and now the question, how we should operate the pump in order to make my operation less expensive, okay? So what they do now, they simply say, okay, I will have two sensors in the tank, one sensor at the top of the tank and one sensor at the bottom. And this line here shows the water level in the tank. So when the water, people start using the water, the water level will, re, will be decreasing, will, be de will decrease and decrease and decrease until the water tank is almost empty. So we reach a trigger, a trigger saying, or a sensor saying, the water tank is almost empty. So what we do is operating uh, a, the tank. So we operate the tank. Once we operate the tank, the pump will fill again, and then we reach a sensor saying, 
uh, the pump, the, the tank is full, okay, at point three here, the pump is full. So what we do, we turn off the, the, the pump and this will cause uh, the water to decrease again from point three to point four. Okay, as you can see, if very simple, this is what is widely used in the uh, in the in practice in the real world. Just simple uh, simple thresholds saying when to operate the pumps and when to turn off the pump. As you can see here, this way is not using any information. It's not accounting for the different prices of energy during the day. So we said, okay, how we can make it wiser? How we can make it smarter? We should use, we should include uh, the information on the energy price to manage our system. So what we suggested, we said, okay, you can make it with a very simple change. Just take the on uh, the pump off a, 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 a trigger okay, the line where you operate the pump and make it decreasing with time. If you make it decreasing with time, then you will end, this is a, a, here in this area, we have a very expensive energy and here very cheap energy. So if you, you want to finish the uh, expensive period with very little water in the tank, okay, because you, you, you can pump this water later with a cheaper energy, okay? So what you do, you want to finish here in the low water levels, and you want to finish the cheap period, okay? The, the, the period with the, uh, the less expensive energy, you want to finish it with a high level. So it's very simple change, that's changing the shape of the lines, and you can see that this, this, a program could be embedded in the local controller, and this will improve the situation in terms of efficiency uh, or cost reduction, which is very massive in, in big systems, like we will show you later. So, if we do that, we will really uh, enjoy a cheaper, uh, a cheaper uh, a operation system, but this is actually causing problems because, as you can see here, for every break in the line, it's actually a, a pump turning off or turning on. So you cannot just turn off and turn turn on and off, turn on and off very frequently because this will cause a, a lot of problems in the water systems. This can cause, uh, as I said here, it can cause uh, damage to the pump because you cannot just stay driving the pump crazy on, off, on, off, on, off very, very fast. This will cause uh, damages, and it can also cause something called water hammer, which is which is a serious issue in water systems. It can really uh, break the pipes and cause a lot of serious problems. And this can also have water quality issues. The water quality in the system could be uh, worsened if you turn off and turn uh, on and off the pumps really frequent in a frequent way. So what we need to do is a balance between these two measures. In order to do that, there is a, a, a method called uh, a multi-objective optimization. So we can use a method called multi-objective optimization to manage two objectives. One thing, we want to minimize, as you can see here in the second bullet, to minimize the energy cost, but we also want to maximize the time period between a uh, pump's operation. We do not, we don't want a frequent pump operation. So considering these two objectives, we can uh, now search for the optimal decision to do. What we did here is we wrote an optimization problem like this. This is a mathematical formulation that could be solved and we can find what is the best way to uh, manage these uh, distances here in order to make the system operation better. You can see here the solution of this problem for a real case study. It's a real system with the real data. And this is the solution uh, of this, uh, of this uh, problem. Here you can see the trade-off 
between the cost and between uh, the time, uh, the time gap uh, between uh, adjacent uh, pumps, adjacent, uh, adjacent uh, switches. So you can see here uh, that as the cost becoming higher and higher, we can keep a more, uh, uh, more time between time gap, between switches. So I will show you here the minimum cost solution. And if we pay a little bit more, we can be actually here, which means that I have, if you pay this much, you can have uh, 40, uh, 48 uh, uh, minutes between pump switches, which is enough for uh, our purposes, okay? So we need to pay this much, the distance between these two points, we can add this cost and then gain a time gap between the switches, which is around 40, uh, 40, um, uh, yeah, 48 uh, minutes uh, time gap. Okay, so if we look at these solutions, you can see here uh, a lot of switches uh, between pumps. But if you look at this solution, you can see that we have very little switches and we can actually take advantage of a, 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 a of the electricity tariff period and may, and actually gain uh, money and make this the uh, make the operation of the system um, a more efficient in terms of uh, uh, time gaps between pump operation and between uh, uh, and the cost of course it's less than what is usually done in the uh, in the in practice so you can see here with a very uh, simple mathematical uh, problem like this you can take it and solve it and embed the solution inside this local controller that i talked to you about and you can just have this program embedded in it it's very small change compared to what is done now in 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 real life they do not, the, the utilities will not need to uh, upgrade their infrastructure. It's the same infrastructure, just a different program. A different program will make a, let, a lot of uh, uh, benefits to the uh, water utility, as I said, without a lot of infrastructure investment in, from their side. Well, this was a local control scheme, but it's not possible to have a local control scheme in every system. Sometimes the system is really complex, like what we have here. So we have a lot of pumps. Every triangle here is a pump. So we have a, a lot of pumps. You have water wells and we have a lot of tanks. Such a system will be really nearly impossible to, uh, it could be uh, possible, but it's, it's very inefficient to manage such system in a local control scheme. To to manage such system, we need something that can observe all the system simultaneously. This is the purpose of central control schemes. But as, as I told you before, central control schemes are really complex to implement and are really costly. So what we tried to do in our research group is to develop methods and uh, methodologies specific methodologies, which could be really uh, uh, implemented in real world. I call this a more practical methodologies compared to what we have in the literature uh, currently, which is more advanced ones that really look at the optimal solution in a very uh, detailed way. And instead of that, we say, okay, we can pay a little, a little, a little bit of optimality, but we want a simple and practical methodology, which could be implemented in real life easily. Okay, so I will pay a little, a little bit of optimality in order to gain the simplicity and the practicality of uh, uh, the solution that I am proposing. Okay, so we have uh, published a paper on this. And uh, in this methodology, where we have uh, we have a demand uh, water demand forecasting, so have a prediction for the demand, and we have the information on the electricity tariff, 
and we solve uh, an optimization, a simple, relatively simple optimization problem. We solve it every hour, and this optimization problem will tell me what pump I should operate and to how 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 long I should operate it. And this uh, a loop is constantly uh, moving in a, a what so called a uh, model predictive uh, control way. Uh, and uh, it's constantly uh, uh, updating the status, reading from sensors, and then updating the, optim the optimization problem, resolving it, and moving uh, in this way. Um, so we propose a demand forecasting, as I said, and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and then implemented this demand forecast. Uh, developed uh, uh, developed uh, an optimization formulation for it. It's a simple one, simple, that gives a near optimal solution. And you can see here that we can gain a lot of a uh, cost reduction by implementing this simple uh, methodology, which could be implemented in real life easily uh, compared to other methodologies uh, uh, available in the literature. Here you can see that we can reach uh, up to uh, uh, 9%, a, a little, uh, nine percent higher from the theoretical minimum. So it's very very nice achievement from a simple a simple uh, uh, formulation to achieve such uh, a good performance. Also, this um, proposed methodology is very very fast. We can use it. In a fraction of time, we can solve the problem in a fraction of time needed for other uh, methodologies in the literature. Here, for example, you can see that this, uh, uh, this line represents the current methodologies in the, in the literature. And you can see that almost 50% of the, uh, the problems that we solved uh, need uh, more than uh, five minutes to, to be solved in, in, a computer, uh, in the computer. But if we look at, the, at this solution, for example, uh, the green line uh, from our methodologies, you can see almost 100% of the methodologies could be solved within five minutes. This is a, a huge difference uh, in practical uh, implementations uh, of uh, implementation of such system. So to, to summarize this section, uh, I showed you uh, different uh, uh, local control schemes, a lo uh, uh, sorry, uh, different control schemes, a local control scheme, uh, uh, one which could be implemented in local controllers in a very cheap way, uh, just, uh, just changing the software without investment on investigation. It's very low cost and still it can provide a lot of benefits to, uh, to the water utility. And if we if we need a centralized a centralized a central control scheme, then we can also uh, have uh, an efficient way to uh, deal with the complexities uh, for such uh, for such a solution. So this is part of my research is focusing on these uh, kind of methodologies, focusing on open water systems. But another branch of my uh, research field is uh, the management of, uh, it's, I call it a macro management, focusing on a regional water systems. Uh, when I talk regional in Israel, and I mean all the country, basically. So we manage all the, the water resources in, in the country-wise, not only one city or one town or one specific system. So we talk about how to deliver, deliver water from the um, uh, sources to consumers in a regional scale. So now I will move to this part where uh, I focus more on a, uh, on, a, uh, on a regional scale decisions. I will go a little bit faster because I want to reach the uh, third section. So Israel uh, is you know, a small country. It's a semi-arid country. We have limited water resources. Usually we rely, uh, in the past we relied on uh, aquifers, different aquifers. We had a small lake here, but this is this is not enough. So what we did in recent years, we built uh, five desalination plants uh, in the show, uh, in the uh, coast, and these desalination plants take water uh, from the sea and desalinate it, and we use it in the water system. 
um, is some data about the uh, Israeli water system. Uh, here are the five plants I talked to you about. So we have five uh, big plants. Uh, we have uh, almost uh, 600 million cubic meters of water coming from desalination. This is basically 50% uh, of the, uh, the natural replenishment that we get in the country. It's very serious amounts compared to, uh, to uh, the replenishment. It's actually uh, 70, around 75% of our domestic use. So it's, it's really a huge portion of the water sector coming from desalination. Um, so uh, when we have desalination in the system, the picture will change. What we have in the past, we used agriculture as a, as a buffer if we have a really bad year in terms of water availability, then we say to the agriculture, okay, we cannot give you water this year and it will be really, the water to agriculture will be really reduced in a, in a massive way. But recently, when we have desalination plants, so we have a reliable source and we have the flexibility for operating it so we can be more flexible and uh, the desalination actually becoming the buffer. If we have a wet year, we say to the salination, okay, we want to reduce you this year and we don't take the whole capacity of the salination. But if we have a bad year, so we can use the desalination in a full capacity. So the desalination is becoming more and more a major player in the water sector. Uh, and agriculture is becoming a more constant uh, player. Uh, this is also in addition to, to using effluents. So we, in Israel, we have a very advanced mechanism of uh, uh, of using wastewater uh, for irrigation. Uh, also, uh, a, the inclusion of the desalination actually improved our effluent quality because when you use a desalination, the salinity of the water is very low. So also the effluents will be in a good quality and this will improve, will be uh, help in using this water in agriculture. Here I show you how agriculture use, water use is drastically decreased during the year. And with that, actually the total water uh, use is also drastically uh, decreasing in recent years. Um, so what we have in the system, as I said, we have aquifers, we have lakes, desalination plants, uh, we have the conveyance system and local distribution systems. Uh, the consumers are urban industry, agriculture, and we also have uh, um, uh, agreements with neighbor countries where, uh, that we have to uh, supply to them uh, uh, water, like Jordanian Kingdom and the Palestinian authorities. Uh, but part of the peace agreement with Jordan, for example, uh, we need to supply for them a certain amount from the Lake Kinneret. And with all of that, we want to develop a decision support system using, as I say, the mathematical optimization models in order to make the decision, uh, uh, the best decision, uh, to find the best decision to make under all of these uh, uh, circumstances that I talked about. It's very important to say that these models are developed and deployed and run for and with the staff of the water authorities. So all the details of, of these models and the data is really coming from the water authority uh, and we work uh, jointly with them in order to make these models in, uh, 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 relevant to them and in order to make them operatable uh, models for real life situations. I will talk now on a, on a, on a tool that we developed for them. It's called OptiDesk. It's developed for the operation department in the Israeli national system, in the Israeli National Water Authority. Uh, OptiDesk is an optimization model it actually the purpose of this model is to say how much water I should take from the desalination plants. Okay, this is the the question that we are trying to say. Given uh, uh, the the natural replenishment, uh, the natural resources. Okay, how much water I should take this year? You will see in a moment that it's not really a very uh, easy question because it's uh, it depends on a lot of factors. Um, so we developed for them uh, a software, a decision support system. It's, it's uh, important that 
Uh, this system is uh, uh, user friendly because different people in the authority will be using it. Um, and this is a sample output. For example, from these models, it tells me how much to take from the first plan, from the second plan, the third plan, every month in the year, in, in next year. Okay. And you can see here uh, different plans and how much they will be reduced. Uh, depending on a, a, a from the solution that I found. So you can see here that uh, this plant, for example, is reduced with 60%. So it's only operating with 40% capacity. But this plant here is only reduced with 10%. So if, if you want the minimum cost solution, this is a solution you have. You reduce the uh, the first plant by sixty percent, and you reduce this plant by only ten percent. But you know this problem, although it is economically the best solution in terms of money, but this is a very problematic solution because you cannot just have this plant working on forty percent capacity and this plant for working on ninety percent capacity. This is very uh, a. a, a a, let's say uh, solution with a bad equity. We need to we need a solution that preserves some equity between the plants. So what we do is we developed uh, a model that can include also also the equity of reduction. So plants can it should be somehow uh, with the equal reduction. Uh, what we can see here is how much we pay in the system if we want to increase the equity. So if we want to increase the equity, the, uh, here in this axis, the equity is increased in this way. So you can see if you increase the equity, you will have to add this much of cost. And now the water authority should decide whether they want to pay this extra money, okay, from here, this extra money in order to increase the equity this much. So we provide the water authority with these solutions, which are summarized here. For example, this solution that they ended, uh, they end up, a, a, for example, let's say the decision maker choose this solution. So he will pay a 20, 23 million shekels extra, okay? Just to increase the equity this much and to make the plants more uh, equable uh, in terms of reductions. So this is just an example of a an example of how these decision support systems could be used in uh, in water agencies uh, in like the water authority in order to make decision wiser decisions on a large scale. Now I will move to the third section of my presentation. And it's about water security. So water security is a very, um, you know, uh, um, uh, active research area in the domain. And uh, when we talk about these water security issues, it's it's actually started with the 9/11 attacks and the thinking of uh, terrorist attacks on critical water infrastructure is is really uh, bothering a lot of decision makers. And especially because water systems are really vulnerable to uh, attack, to, to, uh, to attacks, because the, the water system is everywhere, actually. You can, you can see it in the street and could be easily attacked without noticing. So this is making it very, very vulnerable to uh, attacks. So as I told you, very rich research in this uh, in water distribution systems. One of them is a security, which is the focus of this uh, section of my presentation. When we talk about water security, so we talk about three three types of threats. The first thing, the first type, is just a direct attack on uh, on infrastructures. When you know have an attacker and they, they make damage to the pump station or make damage to the valve, and these kind of attacks, one can uh, uh, address them using uh, physical security uh, means, 
like alarm systems, like clocks and fencing and cameras and stuff like that. This is not the focus of this talk. The focus of this talk is on the second type of attacks, which is using chemicals or biological contamination injections inside the system. So if the attacker can have uh, contamination injected in the water system, what we can do about it? This is a very complicated uh, attack in terms of uh, detecting it because it's really uncertain what type of contamination he will use, uh, what do it. It is very uh, complicated system, as I said, because of a, a problem, because of the uncertainty invo involving it. So when we talk about contamination, we can think of different problems. Let's say, okay, we want to detect contamination in the system, but this problem is, we need to address it, uh, thinking about it in two terms. It's an offline problem and an online problem. How? If we talk an offline problem, it's actually, we need to decide where to put the system, where, where to put the sensors, where we should, uh, uh, what location should be chosen, what are the best location to choose in order to make the system uh, available to detect uh, contamination. And then after you do that, okay, once you detected, uh, uh, detected a contamination, how you can find where this, uh, 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 where this contamination occurred. Another thing that we need to consider is to prepare emergency plans for response. How we should respond after uh, 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 a contamination is uh, detected. And the third one, okay, we detected, uh, we detected uh, a contamination, what we, should do, what we should do now in order to clean the system? What are the decisions that we should make? This is on the offline side of the map, but we also have an online phase of this problem. The online phase is how we should de uh, uh, detect, what, what, what we should look at in order to, de to detect contamination and what should be the response, uh, the uh, short-term response that we should take, okay? So this is also two problems involving in, involved in the online phase of a contamination uh, of uh, injection, uh, contamination injection in the water. You can see here uh, very rich literature on the offline phase. Uh, it varies depending on the topic, but the most maybe uh, investigated problem is the sensor placement problem. But what I'm going to talk now, and a lot of my research really focused on this problem, is the event detection. It's the online phase. Okay, I have sensors placed. How I should uh, operate the systems of sensors in order to uh, find a, or alarm in case we have a contamination uh, a, a contamination event? So as I said, the um, we have a lot of options for the attacker to use. A lot of chemicals. A lot of biological uh, uh, materials that he can uh, use in order to pollute our system. So it's very, very uh, difficult to prepare something which is uh, a dedicated to different pollutants because we have a lot of uh, a lot of possibilities. We cannot cover them all. So what we do, if, if we cannot if I, I have sensors for every possible uh, pollutant or contamination. The other way, the different way that we, sh we can use is just to uh, monitor typical water parameters, okay? Like the turbidity, the pH, the chlorine in the system. So we assume that if there is a new material in the water, these signals of pH, turbidity, and uh, TUC, and different parameters that we usually measure, these signals will be changed. <coughs> and then we can use this change in order to alert for something wrong in the system. So how we can do that? We can use machine learning, we can use uh, data mining, we can use models, in order to detect contamination events. The idea is just to 
uh, look at the water quality measurements and try to see where is something that I did not see before. What is some, when do I have something which is abnormal to what I had seen before? This is the basic idea. So the first paper our group uh, uh, published on the topic, it was in environmental uh, uh, science and technology, uh, as it actually was featured as the cover uh, page uh, paper. And uh, what we uh, suggested here is a myth method, which, which is based on artificial neural networks. So artificial neural network is a, is a machine learning methodology. And we also use a base model, a Bayesian model, in order to use this uh, uh, to infer, to see when we have uh, something which is not uh, okay, which is uh, fishy, which is a suspicion, uh, sus suspected to uh, contamination even. So we have these water signals, for example, for chlorine, and then we analyze it using the method I told you about, and then we actually create something like this. This is something called the event probability. So in every time instance, we say, okay, what is the probability that our system is under attack? And here in the blue line, you can see this is actual attacks that we simulated, and you can see that the system is actually increasing the probability of attack in a correct way, proving that this system is working and it can actually alert uh, uh, when you have something uh, unusual in the system. And we made this uh, method, uh, uh, we actually have a series of papers on these topics. This is another one of them uh, in water research. And here uh, we further developed the method and instead of using, if you noticed here, I used the uh, constant thresholds. This is what we mean by fixed thresholds. And then we use in this paper, uh, in water research, we use dynamic thresholds in order to make the system more robust uh, uh, of, uh, instead of raising a lot of false alarms. So we can uh, treat these false alarms, reduce them by having uh, a dynamic threshold, as you can see in this figure. In addition, what we did is we modeled uh, every signal as an expert. So every expert will tell what is the probability of the event. So this signal will say, okay, the probability is 0, 0.8. This signal will say, okay, the probability is 0, 0.7. And then here we have a manager. This manager will look at these probabilities, the different experts, and he will decide based on all the opinions of these experts. So we call this a logic, uh, a detect integrated logic model. And we actually showed that such a framework can improve the false alarms and reduce them in the system, which is really uh, nice because nobody will really want a system which can all, which, which has a lot of false alarms. Uh, after that, so all these methods that I told you about, they actually uh, focus on um, a one sensor, uh, one sensor and just analyzing the data from this sensor. And as I told you, it's actually based on a pure machine learning methodologies, only just analyzing the data. But what we said, okay, we can use the physics we know the physics of the problem. Why not using the physics of the problem in order to improve our alarm system? And this is what we did in this paper in, back in 2017. What we did is we integrated physically-based models, physically-based simulators with event detection systems. And we did that because we had different sensors. We had different uh, sensor here and sensor here, and we want to make decision based on all of these sensors, on these two sensors in this case. So, so we want to make a, a joint decision based on these and these, and this paper actually shows how this could be done to synchronize different, uh, different, uh, um, uh, different uh, uh, sensor data from different sensors using the physics of the water uh, system. 
Uh, Joe, do you have do you have more time? How 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 do you want to? Do you have would you have more time to keep on with the third? No, oh, no, we only have uh, uh, five minutes to to over okay. the, uh, to finish this. So, so maybe uh, I think it's better to keep these five minutes for questions uh, instead of a, a, a moving on to another topic. What do you think? I don't know if you want to finish your presentation. The 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 the, the questions I could send to you by by email or by by WhatsApp or stuff like that. Well, uh, okay, we have <laughs> another maybe <laughs> another. I can send the, the, you the questions later by by, by email yeah. or well. So I will not be able to finish all the slides in, in five minutes, but I will maybe introduce. That's the last uh, the last uh, th uh, threat. So yeah. we talked about the physical attack. We talked about a contamination attack, and the new type of attacks that we have in the system uh, recently is the cyber attacks. So. The system is becoming, water systems are becoming more and more intelligent. They have sensors, we can, re, we can control them remotely, but this is actually making them more vulnerable to cyber attacks. Okay. So what we can do to handle this, okay? So we can use software engineering, we can use some maybe firewalls and antivirus, but we also need cyber attacks detection systems. We need something in the water system, in the control section, in the control room to say, okay, there is something wrong. And you should consider somebody from outside playing with your system. So we have uh, usually the new systems will look something like this. You have different components transmitting data to, to control system. And what we wanted to develop is a system which analyzes everything and tell us if there is something abnormal. Is it something if 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 the the, the this system will, thinks that there is a hacker in the system or not? So um, this is just showing that uh, water systems are becoming more and more connected to computers, and we have a lot of possibilities for the attacker to access our uh, water system uh, devices and this problem is not really is not uh, specific to water uh, we have designed viruses uh, that can attack the SCADA system can attack control systems uh, there is a uh, incidents in the world uh, uh, discussing these kind of viruses and so if something like this will happen in a real system, it can cause really serious issues. It can damage equipment. It can uh, even play with the water quality. Like if we don't have, if we don't add any chlor uh, chlor uh, chlorine to the system, this is very bad to the water quality. Or oh, it actually can have, uh, uh, in can inject chemicals. Uh, so, undesired so levels of chemicals in. into the water and making them really, uh, really harmful. So, so there is a real, a real threat on this uh, because of because of this. Uh, uh, let's say uh, wide implications. Water systems are attractive target for terrorism and cyber warfare. Okay, there are incidents. Uh, there are reports in the U.S. saying that uh, a lot of incidents are uh, becoming are increase, uh, currently increasing in the on critical infrastructure, including energy and water. Uh, you can see here in Australia, for example, uh, they had a lot. Uh, they had another incident back in 2000, where uh, uh, an unhappy worker released sewage. He actually accessed the system and released sewage into the parks and the streets. Uh, we have another incident back in 2016 where hackers uh, um, uh, played with the chemical levels in the water treatment plant. Another example from Ukraine where also hackers, uh, uh, because of the uh, uh, 
Russian hackers, because of the situation between the countries, they accused the Russian hackers to cause uh, to play with the water treatment plants and 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 uh, and uh, uh, play with the water quality. So this is not something fictional. This is something really occurring, and we have to deal with it. Um, okay, I think I will stop here. So we have a sorry, but we have to, to finish the, the presentation because uh, we have another lecture following this this lecture, and uh, I, I I liked a lot the the lecture that you present, Professor Mashur. Because uh, your lecture focused, I think, focused in important and very interesting issues linked to, to water distribution in Israel, just like uh, homeland security and the money saving, water saving, energy saving, and uh, efficiency on water distribution. And uh, I, I confess you that uh, I never thought about uh, uh, here in Brazil something like uh, the, the, the role of uh, water distribution and uh, and to, to protect the, the system of water distribution against terrorist uh, threats attacks it's it's a very interesting um, issue to be discussed thank you for your your presentation i i really like it a lot and uh, i hope uh, to to talk about to continue our 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 chat our conversation about it in a in a, another occasion. So, so I like it a lot, and thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you and, so uh, much. For I'm the, very uh, sorry to, to finish this, this this section. Very sorry. Okay. And, uh, thank you very much. No, no, I, I thank you, and uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, our session. And thank uh, you very much for the invitation. And uh, talk to you soon. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have some uh, questions, and uh, I will send uh, them later to you. Okay, and uh, thank you for the audience, and uh, thank you bye so bye. much. Uh, and bye, 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 Professor Mashur. Thank you, thank you so much.